But I'm here with my really good friend, Mr. Trey Radcliffe. Trey is always up to something exciting and new. In this episode, we're gonna talk about just what Trey has been up to. Trey Radcliffe, welcome to the show, man. What's going on? Hey, what's going on, Fredster? Good to see you. You always make me happy. Just hearing your voice and seeing your smiling face just it gets me going for some reason. You're yeah. definitely my favorite social lubricant. <laughs> Here, we go. Here we go again with you. I can't, what, what's going on? Come on. Come on. Dude, what's going on? So you're, you are in, uh, you're, you're down under right now in New Zealand hanging out today, right? Yeah, here in New Zealand, uh, back here in the studio. Um, been traveling a little bit, but I love coming home. And actually, I enjoy getting organized. Yeah. You know, I feel like a little bit fray, a little bit uh, out of it. And then I get back, I got to reorganize my photos, get my Lightroom going. You, the amount of time I spend moving files around from one computer to another and organizing di is like digital wrangling. I can't believe how much time I spend doing it. Yeah, yeah. It's like it's it's digital sheep herding, right? You got to move your sheep around, move them over here, make sure they're fed and OK and all that stuff. Yeah. Right. It just convinces you of the natural order and chaos of the universe that data just leads to these entropic situations and things just get lost. You must constantly, you know, expend energy so yeah. that you can keep order to the chaos. Well, I mean, that's depressing because it's, if it's an entropic situation, that means everything you're doing is for nothing because it's all going to go back to zeros and ones anyway. <laughs> Isn't it true? That's why it's just better to be present and just stay in the flow. Yeah. I mean, I probably even worse with you because you've got video files, audio files. You've got more to deal with than I do. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's yes and no. It's, it's once you have a system, as you know. You know, it's uh, it's relatively easy to wrangle, but not having a system can lead to anarchy and and uh, let's say disarray <laughs> on That's your right. hard drive. So speaking of that, there's speaking of anarchy and disarray. I've got notes here. You've got a bunch of oars in the water right now, and only a couple of them we're going to touch on. You've got your fingers in Plotograph, which we're going to talk about. You've got your fingers in Aurora. That software, which people are raving about, you are doing a, a series of worldwide photo walks around the planet. I think you need another planet because this one seems to be too small for you. You're going to be in L.A. in September. Like all, all kinds of stuff going on. What am I missing? It's a, it's a million things that Trey's doing. What's happening? Well, I try to layer all this stuff into my existing life as best possible so it's as, as seamless as, as possible. You know, I do love traveling. I'm a travel photographer. Yeah. And as long as I'm in these places, um, I might as well just do a photo walk. These are always uh, free events. Uh, we spend about an hour or two out taking photos, and I give tips and tricks and try to, I try to help inspire people. You know, I'm very mm -hmm. philosophical. I want them to be very present with their cameras and use photography as sort of a, a meditation to kind of help you find yourself and create yourself and just yeah. kind of be one with it all. I, I love all this stuff. I love spreading this message, and it seems to resonate with people. And we just finished 10 photo walks across Europe. We started in Portugal and ended up in Russia, and we had this bus that we were traveling on with the, the crew, and that was great. And we're about to do 20 more photo walks across Asia. We're starting in Japan at the end of August, and those are gonna be all, or at the end of October, so those are going to be all free events. And then also, we're doing one at Burning Man. We do a photo walk every year at Burning Man. I'm excited about. And then L.A. on September the 9th. Yep. Wow. Wow. That You, you sound like... But you know what's interesting about when, when I talk to you? See, you're... you're like You say I'm the social lubricant. You are the business lubricant, right? Because you, <laughs> like, you make all things seem possible. Like, a lot of people are like, you know, I want to start a, a workshop, but I don't know. And they him and haw about it. Trey does 80 of them. <laughs> <laughs> People say, I want to I want to travel more. Right? You're, you're circling the globe. You're doing all this stuff. How do you fit all this stuff in? Because you've got multiple businesses or at least tangents of one business. You've got an awesome family over there. You've got friends. You've got co work. You've got employees. How does Trey Radcliffe manage it all? Well, I have a great team. Uh, I really owe everything to them. We have about nine people that work for Stuck in Customs. And... The number one thing, Fred, is always the art. I mean, I am obsessed with photography. If I'm not taking photos, I'm processing photos. Obsession. And yep. 
the art business has been doing well. We make uh, big prints, like uh, eight, nine, ten feet across for collectors, and we only do like three prints, and so that's been doing very well. Yeah. So that helps pay for the travel and everything else. Um, but yeah, I just, I mean, I, I will sleep on a bus, I'll sleep on a park bench. I just love getting out and traveling and uh, seeing the world. It's just, uh, it's great. I don't know why I enjoy it so much. It gives me a lot of energy. And also I find that because I get to choose who to surround myself with, yeah. I only surround myself with really positive energy, creative artists. Yeah. And that's yeah. great. You know, I went through a lot of my life and I had like energy vampires, you know, that would kind of drain me. And so every day I just have more and more energy. I also find that, you know, having having an open heart and being vulnerable and not taking yourself seriously at all, this tends to give me a tremendous amount of energy because I'm not I'm not stuck in my own head, like not not thinking about things the right way. I just kind of just go for it. I think that's what life is about, just just going for it. Mm -hmm. And don't worry about the mistakes. You're talking about successes. There's a whole ton of mistakes you're not even mentioning yeah uh, that's okay i forgive myself and and move on and i just want to take pretty photos and help inspire people now do you do you think the 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 concept of retirement fits into what you're gonna you know the the future of trey do you think you'll ever retire or will you just kind of you know start doing less as you uh, you aren't able to do as much as you're doing today I no, I don't think I would ever retire because what I do is already fun. I don't even think of it as work. Yeah. And, you know, I think it. I, I happen to have accidentally picked the perfect kind of thing for retirement because you could take photos your whole life. It's like people that like fishing. You know, they they fish on the weekends or in their spare time, and they retire and they just keep on fishing. That's yeah. the same thing I'm going to do. And there's a lot of parallels between photography and fishing because um, one of the this is something that maybe this is only a recent realization is that when I go out to take photos and when I go out to take photos with my friends that are like me, we really don't care if we get a good photo or not. It's just the process of taking photos is so, you know, heartwarming mm -hmm. and so adventurous and so exciting. And maybe a good photo will come out of it. But of course it's the same reason fishermen love to fish. They don't really care if they get a fish. That's mm -hmm. a bonus. Yeah. But I think it's the same way with photography. So I just enjoy the process and the journey of it so much. I don't know why I would ever want that journey to end. Yeah. The process of capturing that elusive photon, right, or, or uh, combination of photons. So speaking of capturing those photons, I think I read somewhere that, uh, what was it? You've been, you've been like, like a, 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 an organism that sheds its skin from time to time with your photography gear. Right. You will shed yeah. one brand for another if the other one, you know, like you said, it's all about the photography. Right. So if another brand serves your needs better, you have you're not shy about saying, yeah, I'm done with this. And here's why. And I'm moving over there. You moved. You moved again recently. Right. Or are moving again. Well, tell me. Yes. Tell me the Hasselblad story. Right. Um, and so, first of all, I should make it clear it doesn't matter if these companies give me cameras or money or whatever that has nothing to do with who I go for, right? Life is too short. I think people that have been following me on the blog for 10 years or whatever know this. I'm just brutally honest. Yep. And, but I'm still, I'm a nice guy. I don't really say bad things. I will compare, you know, and I, I think would consider it quite an objective way. Uh, but yeah, I, uh, I got the new Hasselblad X1D and I love it. Um, you know, it's the new medium format mirrorless camera. Yeah. It's maybe 10% bigger than my Sony uh, A7R Mark II, which I also love. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I would say the Hasselblad is definitely my go-to camera. Uh, the optics are incredible. Um, I don't have quite the lens selection that I did because I only have three lenses. The only ones they make, the 30 prime, 45 prime, and 90 prime. Mm -hmm. It's a little limited, but that's okay. I just do more panoramas if I want something wider. Yeah. But when I was just in Japan, I would use probably that about 70% of the time and the Sony 30% of the time because the Sony is just faster. I can take more frames per second. I like to take street photos mm -hmm. and sometimes the Hasselblad is a little bit slow for that. Right. right. Um, so I use just... format, right? It's designed to be slow. Yeah. It's, it's a considered... You're, when I think medium format, I think tripod... Uh, yeah, you're you're thinking about the shot, and when you hit that plunger, you know, <laughs> yeah. you hit the plunger, it's actually gonna make a cha-ching sound, right? 
Yeah, you got it. Yeah, yeah. Got it. And then on the other side, I just got the new Fuji X-T2. Is that what it's called? Mm -hmm. But I'm using that just for Burning Man because it's a great camera. I used it. I think I used the X-Pro2 last year at Burning Man. But it's weather sealed, which is really important. It's fast. Um, it's got a great lens selection. And, you know, Fuji people, they love that thing. Well, this is one thing I noticed about Fuji people is that, like, Canon people, Nikon people, Sony people, we kind of know a lot about our cameras. Maybe 50%, 60 70 But Fuji people, they know 100% of that camera. They know yeah. every little thing it can do. They are intense. Yeah. So it's been great. Whenever I have a question, I put it out on Twitter or whatever, and I get amazing responses from really smart Fuji photographers. So I'm learning, but I, I understand why they like it so much. Well, let's transition this, and I want to be respectful of your time. I know you gotta, you don't have that much, but I want to talk about software for a second. So the pixels that you capture with this Hasselblad or the Sony go somewhere, and recently we've been seeing a lot of chatter online about Aurora from Mac Fun Software, right? So tell me what, and and you're involved with them somehow, somehow. So tell me, tell me what is Aurora? What is Trey's finger in that pot? How how does all that stuff right. work? Yeah, so this is similar to the the bag situation. You know, when we made the bags with Peak Design a few years ago, yeah. I was sick of my bag. And so I called up the guys at Peak Design and said, look, I don't know anything about bag design. Actually, I don't know anything about most things. But let's put our heads together and try to design a bag. And that worked out really well. It was scary, but it worked out great. And then so I was thinking, well, I am sick of photomatics. You know, it just doesn't do all the things I wanted to do. And I was getting more and more sophisticated in, in my processing where I would make something in Photomatics, then I would have to pull it into Photoshop and do layers with the original RAWs and mix them together and mask. It was a whole process. So I thought, yeah. you could do all this in one piece of software. So I'm going to call up our friends at Mac Fun and say, let's build like the world's ultimate um, HDR software. And that's where Aurora HDR came from. And we launched it uh, a couple of years ago. And then last year, we came out with Aurora 20, 2017. Mm -hmm. And it's been huge. To date, there have been over 100 million HDR photos created with this software. Jeez, wow. wow. And it's, it's only on the Mac, okay, which makes Windows people very angry, okay? But that's being fixed. And that's being fixed. But yeah, that's the big news, is that now it's finally here for Windows, and um, everyone can, can be excited. Because actually, I switched to Windows... Uh, about nine months ago myself. So yeah, speaking I had, of gear changes, I remember that. That was, un yeah. you used to be like the guy that would shave an Apple logo in the back of his head, and now you're on, <laughs> you're on Windows. What's going on? Yeah, I was, um, well, you know, it was took forever for Apple to come out with a new pro yeah. computer, as you remember. You're even hardcore Mac than I was, and I, yeah. I did love Apple, and I still love Apple. But it, it was getting really slow. Lightroom was getting really slow. And then Apple finally announced their big new uh, uh, computer. And it wasn't any faster than the previous one. Yeah. And a lot of friends get it. They didn't even like it. Just recently, they have up upgraded the line. So now I do believe it's going to be faster. Uh, but I am stuck between worlds once again. I do know that my Windows machine screams. It's really fast. Yeah. Um, and it's much more upgradable and this sort of thing. But I need to compare both once again but it doesn't really matter because now aurora hdr we really want to make it you know the best software for all photographers except for those weird linux people <laughs> yeah and weird linux people direct your mail to stuck in customs and they'll uh, they'll field <laughs> your your comments and uh, suggestions all right so just i want to spend a little bit more time on aurora because photomatics the which is you you actually created a tor tutorial on HDR software and how to do your brand of HDR many, many years ago. And, you know, that was kind of the bedrock in some ways of who Trey Radcliffe is today, right? So, so what you did was take your frustrations and take those over and say, okay, if I could do anything I wanted with HDR software, this is what I do. The Mac Fun people listened and incorporated all those suggestions. What are you giving up? Like for people that, that were like, you know, they're looking at your Photomatics HDR tutorial right now. They're like, okay, right. I'm considering Aurora. What, you know, why would they consider Aurora versus sticking on Photomatics? Right. The only thing people would be giving up is any familiarity they had built up with Photomatics in the past years. Yeah. But what they gain is so much more. Um, A, the user interface is, is much better. Okay. 
Yep. The HDR algorithm is much more powerful. You have much more control over it. One of the things that I discovered pretty early on in HDR is that when you run an HDR algorithm on a photo, it's hard to get the whole thing to look good, right? Like mm -hmm. part of it might look awesome, but then there might be some weird halos or some noise or the sky might look all weird. Yeah. So my technique with HDR is to do different kinds of HDR on different parts of the photo, right? Mm -hmm. Almost like a zone HDR kind of system, yeah. right? And so what you can do with Aurora, to me, the single greatest feature is layers. Mm -hmm. So you can make the base the way you want it to look, and then you add a layer, and you might really amp up the HDR like on a, on a castle or something, right? And then you just brush that part into the castle. Mm -hmm. And there's another area I really like called image radiance that kind of gives it this Orton glow. And so maybe you want that to happen around the sun, around the trees, so you might amp up the image radiance and then just paint that part into those areas. Sure, sure. So it's totally customizable and um, really fast. I think that's the other thing I like about it is how, how fast it is. Oh, and the presets. The presets are incredible because you can see giant thumbnails at the bottom. And you don't even have to click on the presets to see what they're going to look like. You just, you just know instantly. That's cool. That's cool. So it sounds like it's more, it's more user friendly. Now then why, so devil's advocate, why would someone that's like excited about HDR, whether it be, you know, artistic HDR or architectural HDR, whatever, why would they get excited over a piece of software like Aurora versus just doing it all in say Photoshop? Cause you can do all this stuff in Photoshop, right? You can, but it's very difficult to do a lot of this uh, hardcore stuff. Yeah. Um, doing real tone mapping in Photoshop is just not that good. And, um, and it's hard and extremely time consuming. This just does it with a very simple slider that's very quick and easy to use. Uh, basically, it's just a huge time savings tool. Like yeah. I, I can do it all in Photoshop. I can make it all happen in Photoshop, but my time is, is valuable. Right. And right. Uh, I'm able to like produce you know, probably 50 times as many photos, uh, 50 times as fast using this tool versus using combinations of Lightroom and Photomatics and Photoshop. Yeah. Uh, plus, the workflow is easier. And it just it seems more logical in my mind that I can do everything I need um, inside this one tool. And if you want to, you can use it in coordination with Lightroom. So you can have your photo in Lightroom, and you can round trip it to Aurora. The other the other thing that I probably don't sell enough about uh, Aurora HDR is that you don't need to have three bracketed photos to make a good HDR photo. A single raw photo, you pull it into this. You go down to that HDR structure area, and it will recreate your photos like you've never imagined. See, that's crazy. That that is crazy, and and yeah, it, it's interesting. Like the, when I was listening to you thinking about talking about how it is the it basically what you're saying it's the path of least resistance to getting to HDR to to the desired results versus you can go around that way, but it's you know. There's a fire, there's a thicket, there's there's a cobblestone path, or you could just take this straightaway paved road <laughs> and and get there. So yeah, yeah, that's that's interesting. So the continuing on the software vein though, there's another piece of software out there that you've got your hands in that are that's separate from Aurora HDR, which is focused on HDR. This one's completely different, although I assume you could animate an HDR photo. Um this one's called Plotograph. Tell me about that, because I've been, I've been publishing a couple things about this. I've been talking to those guys, and I know you're involved with them. So tell me about, tell me about Plotograph and why it's cool. Yeah, I love Troy and Sasha. I think that Plotograph is one of the coolest new technologies that I've seen in photography in a long time. Yeah. And the reason, I've always thought about, like, why do I like it so much? And I've always had something in my head that, you know, brains and memories are not really JPEGs. They're not still moments. To me, memories are kind of like extended moments where there's movement and you just kind of remember a bit of a scene. And I think, I bet 100% of people that have seen Harry Potter and seen those moving pictures, you think like, oh, that's so cool, yeah. a moving picture. And I understand why it can be jarring to a lot of traditional photographers because like a photograph isn't supposed to move. Like, Everyone is, has to define things, like what things should and shouldn't do. Right. You know, I'm not like that. I'm, I'm much more creative. I'm like, there's no right answers. There's no wrong answers. It's all just kind of in this you know, sea of probability, right? Mm -hmm. 
And for me, when I look at a photo and it starts to move, I find it just mesmerizing. And the cool thing about this tech, you start with a single JPEG, and then it allows you, to, for example, to animate the clouds. And it looks like a movie, even though it comes from a single JPEG. And the real trick is that it loops around and starts again, but you can't see where the loop is. See, that is the magic. So seamlessly looping. And this, this is a... So a lot of people will be thinking, yeah, what Trey's describing is a cinemagraph, right? This is not a cinemagraph because it, what may be lost on some people is that you said you're starting with a still photograph. You're not starting with a video, which is what typically, generally speaking, a cinemagraph needs to start with a video clip that was moving to begin with. And you freeze it and release some motion in it. This is completely different, right? Yeah, a lot of people do think it's like a cinemagraph. And you kind of have to get your head around it that it's not. Yeah. For one thing, a cinemagraph is hard to capture because you're going to have to set up to a little movie file and you have to find the right kind of scenario where some stuff is moving and stuff, some stuff isn't. And then editing the cinemagraph always seems a little bit not so easy. Yeah. And oftentimes with the cinemagraph, you can see a loop. You know, you can see when it restarts. See the jerk so or the bounce, like, yeah. And so this allows you to go back through your last several years of photos, however long you've been taking photos, and animate them. And I've noticed that when you share these animated photos online, because uh, now everywhere, everyone loops, uh, Instagram, yeah. Facebook, Twitter, all of them, is they get like, you know, 30, 40, 50 times the social engagement as, as normal. Yeah. So it's, uh, and it's just really fun. And it's easy. We just, we actually just released the iPad and iPhone app mm -hmm. uh, for iOS. So we have a scaled down version of it. Yeah. And it's quite inexpensive. And uh, it's been doing great. In fact, right now it's at number 17 in the overall, in the App Store, which That's is not... It, it's in millions do. of apps, right? That's amongst a crowd of millions. It's numbered, it's in double digits. That's crazy that it could do that. Yeah. 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 I, I believed in these guys the first time I saw them. Same here. And then, you know, full disclosure, I'm part owner in the company now just because I believe in it so much. Yep. Um, I've just been having a, a ball using it. And now, now the masses, the online version which is very robust and meant for professionals, that's maybe a little bit more expensive. Maybe some people can't, can't afford it, but it's uh, $20 a month mm -hmm. or $30 a month based on uh, your budget. There's also a free version where you can unlock features based on how many followers you have. Oh, wow. But yeah. the iOS version is quite affordable, I believe. It's like it's five bucks. It's four ninety nine. Five right? bucks, yeah. yeah. It's a special right now, five bucks. I think it'll, it'll go up. It's scaled down, but still super powerful. Yeah, yeah. All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put you on the spot here. So you've been raving about this software, and I'm guessing that you're in front of a really powerful computer right now. So uh, you want to share? You want to do a quick demo of what this software sure. can do? I, I think you might have an image or two it might work on. Got a few. <laughs> Got a few images. All right, can you see this on my screen now? Yeah, I see it. Okay, so this was taken here in uh, New Zealand, just down the road from me. And as you can see, it's currently animated okay mm -hmm. well how does it work okay i loaded up a single jpeg file let me it's pause here and what you can see up here are arrows okay so i can click the animate button and i just kind of drag it across a shape in the sky like this like that the longer the arrow the faster it goes okay and then you might see all these little red dots down here these are anchor spots you can use a brush but I like to use these things called anchor spots or stabilizer points. Mm -hmm. And so basically everything under here will not move. Okay. You like putting a pin in fabric, right? Exactly. I put a pin in, in, in fabric and I'm going to do it a little bit down here because I want the water to move a little subtly too. Okay. And then I can click here. Okay. And you can go to different presets. There's one here called the Ratcliffe effect. Oh <laughs> God. You're kidding me. I There's a Ratcliffe it. effect in there. I recommend it. <laughs> Hey, I want you to know that was their idea. It wasn't my idea. But I was like, you want to do it? I was like, okay. So then anyway, I press play. And what it does is now start to render it all on the back end. Because mm -hmm. it's a tremendous amount of computing power to figure out how to turn this uh, into an animation and have it loop around um, smoothly. Yeah. Um, these are just a few of the features. I'll, and I'll show you one other picture after this once it gets going. Yeah. One yeah, difference. This is, this is cool because it, it the like you said before, 
you have to get your head around what's happening here because this is a still shot that you, when you shot it, you did not real, you weren't really thinking I'm going to shoot this for animation, but you can then go back after the fact and make those decisions and add animation, which is crazy. Absolutely. So there you can see how smooth it is. You could watch it for hours and never see the loop. Okay, let me show you. I'll show you a complex one. Okay, this one is really easy, right? Just because yep. we had movement in the in the clouds and nothing else really was moving. Um, so let me go back here and I'll show you a much more complex one. And this is about as complex as it gets. And even though this one is complex, it only took me about mm, 10 minutes to make. Because you're just okay. dropping points and drawing animation vectors, right? That's right. So this is um, Lake Wakatupu here on the South Island. These are the Southern Alps. And so in this one, what I want the clouds to do is I want the clouds to be coming up over my head mm -hmm. and I want the reflection in the water to do the exact same thing, but in the opposite way. Yeah. Um, and then there's also these little bits of fog in the middle that are moving around. Okay. I had to drop a lot of pins because other parts that I don't want to move, like the tops of the peaks and so on and so forth. I will tell you, while this renders, I'll tell you one big feature that's different with the iPad and the iPhone version is that as soon as you press play on those, it's immediate uh, because we moved all the code to the GPU inside the iPhone and the iPad. Mm -hmm. And so you can adjust the speed, make it go faster and slower. Um, yeah, really powerful. Whereas this one is sending it up to, it's sending the, the data up to the cloud to crunch the numbers and then sending it back down, kind of like, a, like an Amazon Echo device or something, right? Exactly, right. It's sending it to our, our uh, servers in Bulgaria, I guess. Got it. Um, yeah, so cool. And the other thing you can do, which I, I won't show you now, but you can export this, and then it's immediately available inside of Instagram or uh, Facebook or, or what have you. I think the actual file that you export is maybe only five seconds long, 10 seconds long. It's an MP4. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you can also export these at 4K. You know, there's a lot of uh, big commercial entities that are doing this, like uh, showing a, a sneaker stepping in water yeah. or smoke coming off of a car. Uh, so if you're a commercial photographer, it's a really interesting thing you can deliver to your clients. And they'll look at it and be like, how'd you do this? And then, you know, something special that you have. That's crazy. So now, if you look at this one closely, you'll see there's lots of things happening. Uh, you can see that there's a uh, fog moving across uh, under the mountains. Mm -hmm. The clouds are all going in different directions, looping smoothly. And the last thing you might see is this uh, kind of snowfall. We have these new overlays right here. You click on this, the overlay library. You can add in uh, different kinds of snow flurries. You could add in uh, rain, um, smoke, all kinds of stuff. So that's, that's pretty crazy. Cool. All from a and still photo. Yeah, all from a still photo. Wow. Now, what do you like from a from sort of an industry? I don't know, philosophical standpoint. Do you do you see this as like photograph or animating your your images? Do you see this as a future of photography, or is this where photography is heading? Considering the number of screens and CPUs that everyone has around them at all times. I I don't think that this is like the the only direction that photography is heading. I think photography is heading into a lot of different directions. Yeah. yeah. And there's no need for one of them to win, you know. Um, it's kind of like saying, well, you know, what's, uh, where's the human population going? Are they all moving to New York or Tokyo? It, that doesn't matter. Both cities are awesome and they're both growing. Yeah. Um, but this is a very new, fun thing. And people are just very not everyone's into this but some people just love watching a photo that moves and yeah. if you think about it if you're once you have the ability to put these on your screens at home which you can um looking at this versus a still photo is not better or worse it's just different yeah you can certainly see how people walking through your house would look at a photo and watch it loop and go like what what is that is that a video is it a photo what What's going on? I think this is probably one of my favorite aspects of it is that it's a little confusing to people. Mm -hmm. uh, I think counterintuitively, as an artist and as a creative, you like to confuse people and make their mind wonder what, what exactly is going on there. And yeah. I think that's kind of a, a fun place to be artistically. I love it. I love it. Yeah. It's a, it's a, I said in a, in a blog post after an interview or on an interview I did with Sasha and Troy that it feels like um, 
it feels like a new form of art. You know, it's a new way for for artists to express themselves. But that's not to say that, you know, just because they have a new paintbrush in their, you know, on the palette there or a new color combination on the palette that that they have to do everything in that. Right. I think my prediction would be some enterprising photographers will start blending these like even even photographs with traditional cinemagraphs where you have a looping you know, background like yours and then some sort of tactile movement in the foreground as well. There's, the sky's the limit. It's just pixels, right? So, yeah. Look, you have to, I think if you're a photographer nowadays, obviously you have a lot of tech people that watch your show. Is you yeah. always, even if you're not into it, it's good to play around with it and practice it and, and stay very fresh and uncomfortable trying new tech because I promise you, in 10 years, people aren't going to be flipping Instagram on their phones, right? Yeah. They're going to have on AR or VR headsets. They're going to be in 360 space. Yeah. The idea that photos were once these little squares that are on Instagram, people will be like they were. People will look at those all day. Yeah. No, everything's going to totally change. And we're going to have to build, we, the creatives of this earth, are going to have to build content for all this new stuff. There's going to be yeah. 360 photos, 360 movies, 360 photographs. There's, there's just going to be all kinds of content that we have to create for the new medium. Yeah. And even yeah. though everyone's like, oh, I don't have many followers on Instagram. That's not good. It, d it doesn't matter. Instagram, in that, it, it's not going to be around in five <laughs> or ten years. Yeah. It's, it's completely different. So yep. the point is just play with new tech and always be looking at the new mediums that humans are going to be interacting with. Because it's not going to be the same in ten years. Yep, I agree. I agree 100%. You know what I'm looking forward to? And mark my words here. This may have happened already, but I'm guessing it hasn't. I want to see a gallery in some big city that is completely empty. It's like a warehouse with nothing but white panels in there. And they yeah. hand you VR goggles at the door or whatever, some sort of mechanism to see the art. And you walk in and you see the art in 3D, whether it's motion or still or whatever. I think that right. would be, that'd be killer because now you're that'd in a gallery. Great. Yeah. yeah, and everyone may see slightly different paintings on the wall based on their profile. Yeah, see? <laughs> we got to do this. We got to put it together. Yeah, yeah do it. <laughs> cool, man. So what's coming up for you, Trey? I'm going to let you go in a second here. What's, uh, what's, what's coming up? We mentioned those photo walks on September 9th. There's a photo walk in Los Angeles. If people are listening to this or around and want to sign up for it, I assume stuckincustoms.com, they can go sign up? Yep, yeah, we'll have a Facebook event also. Uh, okay. That's right. And uh, just just hanging out, taking photos. You're heading to um, Burning Man in a minute, though, aren't you? Burning Man in about two weeks. Yeah, it'll be fun. Uh, we have a we have a photo walk there every year. It's always fun for photos and experimentation. Yeah. Um, how long have you been going there? It's this is like what's how many years so far? Uh, seven years. Seven has years it changed? How how has it changed since year one to year seven? I don't think it's changed much. I think I've changed a lot. Yeah. Uh, it's sort of a, a, it's a new and same kind of experience every time and you mm -hmm. get out of it, whatever you want to get out of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I know it's really helped me artistically to uh, push boundaries and try new things. Um, I, I read a really interesting uh, book from this neurologist talking about the more open-minded you are, um, Kind of, there's a direct correlation between that and how creative you are, right? Mm -hmm. How how much stuff you can create and how much energy you have to create. Yeah. So I find it's a really good place to go, be open-minded and non-judgmental, and just have fun, you know, with the fabric of everything that is to be human. Yeah. And so it's uh, it's a great place for that. And artistically, I take a lot of uh, chances that I don't normally take, like I remember that very first year I was there, I was wearing these orange goggles, these orange. Um, goggles to protect me from the sandstorms and stuff. And so everything I saw had this orange filter. So reds were like super red and yellows and my glasses were always dirty. And then I would look at my photos and my photos didn't have that. So I thought, I wonder if I can really like push the Lightroom presets to make it look like it did through my goggles. Yeah. And so I started making these really extreme Lightroom presets and it didn't even cross my mind to sell them. But then we started selling Lightroom presets and we sold like tens of thousands of these things. And then I started wearing different kinds of glasses and doing different kinds of stuff just to, to see how I could push the Lightroom presets in different ways. And I, not all of them look great, but some are really interesting. And I never would have tried that had I not tried to like 
break Lightroom with the most extreme presets I could. Yeah, yeah, I love it. I love it. Again, another prediction in the future, I'm going to be able to put on my glasses or goggles and be able to look at the world through a Trey Radcliffe pl preset, right? <laughs> that would <not>? be cool. <laughs> right? Be it would be cool, cool. to do yeah. that. Ah, oh, we were born too early, man. Cool, Trey. Well, thank you, man, for coming on. So, Aurora 2018. The Aurora 2018 for Mac and Windows is August 15th. It's I August believe. 15th. Okay. Yeah, I think that's the day it drops. And it's not just that it's the same thing for Windows. It's that both versions have all new features, twice as fast algorithms for HDR tone mapping, a bunch of new stuff, parity, Windows users get everything Mac users get. And some might say the Windows version is even faster. <laughs> yeah, we'll see about that. We'll, we'll we'll pit it against the best Mac in your Windows machine. We'll see. We'll do a we'll do a side by side. There you go. There you go. Cool. I'm intrigued by the idea that you can use just one raw image to get some good results out of versus which kind of opens up a lot of the world versus you know you have to put your camera on a tripod and you know and make sure all three images are perfectly registered. If you can just do it with one shot, there's a lot more alternatives that you have to shoot in terms of things that we're moving to begin with, right? That's right. And I think people inherently know this, especially if you use Lightroom, how much data there is in a RAW file. There's a lot of light in that RAW file. Yeah. And really, I think people have gotten maybe too used to Lightroom is that, oh, I can just adjust the highlights and the shadows and the whites. And, the, and you think that's all there is, but there's a lot more in there. Mm -hmm. And these tone mapping algorithms inside Aurora can really pull some magic out of those raw shots. Love it. Love it. Trey Radcliffe, thank you, sir. I will see you soon, maybe in L.A. Are you, you're going to be in L.A. in a couple weeks or... I will. Yeah, come on down, FBJ. Let's All right. let's keep the party going down there. We'll come down there. We'll we'll party it and uh, and uh, get banned from the town. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I like it. Stuck in customs, you banned from next LA. Level. <laughs> next level, I like it. All right, Trey. Thanks a lot, man. Bye. All right, see ya.